said before, and I tend to agree. It's softly hard to understand. It's just you of me. Yeah, yeah. Your soul's on fire and your heart starts to yearn. You hear your savior calling, but you wonder which way to turn. right back in prayer Oh, follow your heart Love Love will lead you there Love will lead you there You turn your eyes skyward and search for a sign On the streets paved with solid gold It'll want to really turn and wine Questions, thirst for answers, you have a need to know. Your soul hangs in the balance, should you walk, run, stay or go? Yeah. Whoa, follow your heart. Turn your thoughts right back to prayer. Saving grace, love will surely guide you in your own time and your own place. Oh, from your heart, turn your thoughts right back to prayer. Welcome to this week's edition of the Wispy Mob Music Acoustic Radio Podcast Series. I'm your host, Todd, middle initial C. Walker. Yes, that's right, it's me. And we have been listening to Follow Your Heart from the 2000 CD titled Ordinary Man by And The Boys. And The Boys, two of the three, are sitting right in front of me. Uh, Rick Winden to my left and Richie Ricker. They're both named Rick. Uh, Richie Ricker to my right and... Guys, one, this is one of my favorite all-time CDs. I think I've mentioned it to you before, but it really is. And you must have recorded that, what, the year prior? At least the year before. Okay. Listening to it now, or that song, I don't know how often you, you two listen to this CD, but listening to it just now, what kind of memories does it bring back? Yeah, it was, ha- it was, it was happy. It was good times. Um, I probably haven't listened to that CD in, I don't know, five, six years. Maybe. Really? That long? Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't listen to it. Why not? Um, and no one has CD players anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have an older car. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. How about you, Richie? It, it's, it's one of those, uh, I, it's funny because I just loaded that into my computer the other day. Mm. Did you really? Yeah. Because he's right. I've only got one vehicle that's got a CD player in it. And uh, if I listen to CDs, it's usually through the Blu-ray <laughs> on the stereo system there. And it it was just, it sounds really good. I got to say, man, that, I, can't, I, I guess I keep forgetting about that. You know, it's um, I talk about people's music when I hear it recorded, whether it's an album or CD or a download. Um and I refer to them either either from a movie aspect. In other words, I can picture this as the song the opening a movie or ending the movie while the credits go by. The other thing I will say is radio friendly or radio ready. That song is radio ready, in, in my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. It it's got all the elements of, uh, you know, it's got the groove. It's 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 light. 
I can just see people, if they're listening in their car, just tooling down the road, to, you know, tap into one foot or, or groove into it. And the songs on this CD, and again, it was produced or released in the year 2000. How long prior to that were those songs initiated from a writing standpoint? I guess, Rick, you're the author of the... Right. Um, yeah, I would, I would say the oldest is maybe three years old at that time. That's all. So we, we played those songs out a lot, and that changed the songs over a period of time. So the, by the time we went to record the songs, we had recorded on four tracks and other things just to play around with the songs for you know, at least a year before we actually went to record them. So they were, they were pretty mature songs by that time. Now, Richie, were you performing live as the trio at that point in time? Yeah, we actually did some gigs around the Mount Airy area. Um, the long defunct uh, Christie's, which was right behind McDonald's, and uh, another place up there, which is now uh, the Pizza Joint. Um, I'm trying to think of where else we played at in that time frame. We there, played at the church. There were, there were a, two or three years where we played as a trio um, and played those songs uh, during that time, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't just being a trio, obviously, just two of you. Who was the third? It was a neighbor of mine, uh, Jeff Hubbard. And uh, we got together with him. I think we first started out, it was probably 92, 93. And we just kind of got together to jam and stuff. And uh, and then over time, you know, Rick and I still played as a duo. And then I guess mid to late 90s, we started to incorporate him into the the mix of uh, the originals we were working on. So how did the duo begin? Was it something you met at church or you met at work or something like that? We, we actually met, I was thinking about this uh, earlier today, we met in 1984 in church. And uh, the pastor of the church, I guess, knew that we both played music and, yeah. uh, and asked, you know, if we, if we would play a song. And I thought, Oh, uh, you know, a bass player. <laughs> and here we go. So, uh, so Richie came over to my house. I guess that's when we first we first met, and uh, we did a Curtis Mayfield song. Uh, People get ready. That's the song we did, and that's the song we did in church. And and he brought over this fretless bass, and uh, it was very cool. That, that's so. That's where we started. Um, and then we, you know, we ended up playing in a uh, a band. And then, as bands do, that that sort of you know played played out. And then um, I went wanted to play again as you know maybe a solo or a duo. And I talked to Richie about that. So we played as a duo for the longest time, um, you know, as we do today. So yeah. now, Richie, the fretless bass that he's referring to is that the fretless bass I see you play today. It. <laughs> pieces was, of it <laughs> there, yeah it was uh the best way to describe it is a franken bass because it was my the fender jazz fretted bass that i play today i had the uh the frets filed down and then i put the boat lacquer on it and made it into a fretless for many years and uh i guess it was um later in the 90s i was starting to hear some uh incredible bass work by uh some other players and i was like well, I'm going to need frets for that. So then I had the you know the frets refinished on that. Actually, before I did that, I I bought this fretless neck um, uh, from Chuck Levin. So I'll never forget that nice rosewood fretless neck and uh, played that. I think I played fretless exclusively for like 14 years, and then got the frets redone on the bass. Bought another body, a Warmoth body, and then put the fretless neck on that. So it looks kind of cherry looking. And, uh, and that's the way it is today. There are many people who listening who are guitar players. And like myself, they probably think, I couldn't play the guitar without those frets. Yeah. How do you know where to put your fingers? Sort of like being a, a violinist or a, yeah. a cello or whatever. Is it just well, muscle it, memory? It, or? It, it, it's, it's actually this particular fretless neck had lines on it. So I knew where to put my fingers. But when you're playing it, you got to remember you got to play on the fret, not in between them. And after a while, it just kind of, you know, it became casual. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all this time you were doing the duo, were you playing 
mainly in church or did you have gigs at restaurants or uh, we we played out quite a bit um a lot of the places that i had played as a solo uh, before we were able to get you know duo jobs there so we, we played out we played out a lot um as a duo and you only have to split the check by two so, <laughs> <laughs> so that That's was a, nice. that encouraged us to play more yeah now were you playing mostly covers at that point in time we always yes but we always pushed in the original songs i don't know what the the ratio would be but always well i mean your originals i mean i know them as you but i would imagine when you were doing some of these gigs where you'd say let's let's say you do 80 percent covers and you throw in one of your originals i would imagine many of the people in the crowd would go is that no 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 that that's not him would that be because your songs again like i i mentioned your songs are radio friendly so they they're good enough that they could have been done by one of the the big name people so they blend very very nicely in fact when you perform at some of the the things i've had you do like charity events and uh one of the songs that i think you did so extremely well was eleanor rigby Hmm. I loved your arrangement of that. But I love your songs, the way you play your songs so well, it's almost like, huh, as good as you play the covers. Right. So which do you guys prefer playing? Well, we're, we're, we're recording this in, in the studio at my house, and that I refer to this as the place we do bad things to Beatles songs. <laughs> um, so we like... Um, deconstructing songs and coming back with a, a, a different slant. Um, we just enjoy that that process of, of doing that. But I, I like the original songs because um, it's all new and we can play with it however we want. We don't offend anyone. We can do whatever we want to do. But it's just, it's a similar approach. Like the first time that I would introduce a tune to Richie, until it finally gets recorded, it changes a lot. It changes, you know, uh, and a lot that has to do with Richie and sort of his interpretation of it. And well, let's do this. Well, let's go this direction. So, uh, I think we like that process. Now, Richie, is that tempo-wise you're doing that, or is it uh, just from what a, what I would call a musical feel? It can be a musical feel. It can be uh, the way you, like Rick saying, interpret it in the way I might play it in a, in a certain melodic way on the bass. And then the, the kicker is he'll introduce it to me. We'll play it one night. And then the next time it's, well, that's not the way you played it the first time. Like I know, and I can't remember how I did it. And that kills me. So it really benefits us to record it the first time, just so I can remember what the heck did I do? Cause I'm, I'm constantly thinking differently depending on tempo and, uh, and, 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 a the way you carry the, the root. I'm. I feel like sometimes you, 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 for just a duo, you're playing the bass note. You're going to hold down the bass, but you want to add something to it that another instrument may have done without overplaying. And uh, and and sometimes I have to get reminded, it, you know. And and oh, oh, thank you for doing that because now I remember I did this on that. Okay, and that's the way I think it's it's fun to do. I I, I love that because I can play a little extra here and there just to fill in a little space. But I have to be very careful not to overplay. Now, of the two of you, who is the most musically educated? Hey. Mm. I had three the, years of piano in <laughs> elementary school, and that's about it. <laughs> I played saxophone and jazz band, but... That's, I, that's I, better. I, I wouldn't consider either of us uh, yeah. musicians in that sense. So you play... Mostly by ear? Yeah. I mean, we do um, quite a few songs open tuning on guitar. Um, I know what, I know how to tune that. I know what chord that is, but I have no idea what the chords that I'm playing are. Like literally none. Um, I just kind of sense it out and feel it, feel it out. Um, so I'm sure that qualifies me as a non-musician <laughs> but when you but when you tune the guitar to this alternate tuning you yeah. must 
you must tune it, say, to an E or something that mm -hmm. is, t so it's pitch correct for one of the notes, mm -hmm. whether it's the root note or something, right? So that Richie can actually play with you. Just a root. <laughs> That's all I need to know. <laughs> but do you so? Um, what's your your favorite? alternate tuning or what do you normally use when you play I, I like a c tuning um a lot and i've uh i've figured out the chords and the minor chords and sevenths but i don't actually know which chords they are i know how they fit together i know how to use the the open strings in c um and i like that because i think it's it's free to write songs it's inspirational um, it's not necessarily because I'm lazy. I just, I like not knowing that stuff. So it's a journey adventure in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how long did it take you from the time where you were playing in standard of pitch to get so you could actually play in your open C tuning? I don't think I know any, well, very few, unless we've, um, done something strange to a song. I think the only open tuning songs I really play are just my songs. Um, so it was a way for me to create new tones and modes for our own stuff. So I don't know, last 10, 15 years, maybe I've been doing it to some extent. Does it make a difference to you, Richie, playing bass? I think you have the root, but where it, it gives me a little open door because these are like augmented chords or something and I can play around up on the higher register at certain notes to to make a third or a, a fifth or, or you know a seventh or a ninth just to bring in a little drama to it so it it, it kind of gives me a little more to play with actually well the the few times i've had to ask you um, one was when i was i had to do an ukulele part for a, an original song and i had the rough recording and i could not figure out the chords and i sent the mp3 to you mm -hmm. And you said, oh, it's, this is the progression he's using. Do you just hear that, or did you sit down on the piano and figure it out? I hear it. Do you? It's, uh, God's blessed me with that ear, and, it, and I could sit here and, and hear a song and play it in a certain way on a guitar. I might have to use a capo, but I know the, the, the way it's going around. Now, is it the same with you, Rick? It is not. <laughs> no, Richie's always been the one, even when we're in a band setting, uh, he, he he's always able to to sort of understand the different notes within a chord or if we're, if we're, how we're changing it or maybe a transitional chord like he just knows that and is uh, you know put your finger here turn that yeah, that's it you know? <laughs> yeah well you did one time you and I were playing at Red Shaman Farm Brewery I uh -huh. think and uh, I've forgotten what the song I was doing um, rock and roll music by Peter Paul and Mary Okay. I dig rock and roll music. Oh, yeah. And we were going along, and and after we finished it, you said, next time you do that, at this spot, go to the E. <laughs> oh, really? That was it bold of me, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, it, it didn't sound good the other way. And next time I played it, I went to the E, and I went, darn if he wasn't right. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's just a hearing thing. You just yep. feel it and hear it. Yeah. It, and, and that's why, as a kid, I think, before I was really playing guitar even a lot, I was hearing the bass lines or I was hearing harmonies or something. And I think that's the, 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 the gift of when, when I first started to play piano, you're, cause you're doing a lot of chords and you're seeing it on the keyboard, how the thirds and the fifths, the ninths, whatever work. And, and I absorbed it. Or he put it in my head. I mean, that's just who he is. The, you know, the Lord's a good thing. And, uh, and it gives me that vision, but I'm lucky. I'm really lucky to have that. Now, Rick, the when you write a song, hmm. do you write the lyrics like like someone would write poetry, or do you sit down at the guitar and you're just fiddling around? And you go, oh, I kind of like the sound of that, and oh, that brings this to mind, or you just blurt something out. How do you go about writing your songs, from lyrics and then musically? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I've read about how various people do that, and I, I think it's. It's interesting. I the songs that 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 we have that I consider, you know, in my opinion, the better songs, um, they they kind of come at the same time. the The chords, the chord structure, the feel, 
the words, sort of more the sounds of the words than the meaning, that sort of comes all together. And then maybe there's a, a verse or something that turns into be a chorus or a bridge. There's something that starts to stick. And then I just build it around that. Um, not in a real structured way, but just it's just all of it kind of flows at the same time. Now, I've, I've written songs where, you know, I work on lyrics alone without any musical idea or the other way around. And I don't like them as much. They don't feel as organic. They don't feel as connected. Uh, but you can't always just sit down and it happens. So uh, when that does, it's kind of precious time. And I try to freeze everything around and, you know, capture that. Well, you mentioned the last time I heard you at Chabro back in the summertime, and you were introducing whatever song you were going to play, and you said, this is a fairly short song. It's basically a chorus. Hmm. I like to write choruses. I don't like to write verses. Now, did I get that correct, or did I get it reversed? No, that for that particular song, that's right. Uh, it's The chorus is the fun part. Um, sometimes you have to struggle to make verses work, to support the chorus, at least in my mind. The bridge is always a fun part because that's a free-for-all. Um, it can kind of loosely connect. Uh, but yeah, that song just has a chorus and a bridge and no verses. But listening to it, if you did not introduce it that way, I wouldn't know. How about you, Richie? I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah you wouldn't. You really wouldn't know. Um, and I love that song, too. It's like can't we do that again? You know, r run it around one more time. I'm always teasing them about that, but it's such a beautiful song. Now, when you sit down together and, and Rick is bringing, say a new song, you're sitting down here and you're getting mm -hmm. ready to, whether it's to record it or just to rehearse it or work it out. Yep. Does he bring it to you as a finished song or this is, this is the, 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 the footprint. This is the draft version. Where should I go with this? Does he bounce anything off you? How do you, how do you guys work that? I, I think that's that's basically sometimes it's it's just he's just working on a verse and a chorus or just you know starting the beginnings of it but most of the time he's got it pretty well mapped out to a certain way and uh and i just start playing along to it and i try to i try to be open-minded in how i, I don't want to be dictating a, a certain thing i just want to play along to what he's got and uh and uh what what a lot of good players will say they serve the song mm -hmm. not take it someplace else serve the song yeah the uh, i've heard too many lead guitarists not serve the song <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they go off on a tangent it's yeah. kind of like well wait a minute you know you're supporting this the songwriter here right and, and the music not right. this isn't your well and, and and he writes such good stuff it's like you know i just want to try to uplift it a little more without changing the course well you know writing such good stuff as richie just said that just is how you write or do you have a lot of what we call the throwaways in order to get to those really good things? Yeah, we, we almost hit on it before where we'll, we'll play with the song for a while and then we come back to it. We can't remember it. I like not remembering it because if it's not good enough to remember, then it probably wasn't good enough. <laughs> so I, I like letting things go through the process and there are songs that, uh, maybe maybe a third of the songs that just kind of we might even play them out for a while but they just kind of fade because they're not we don't feel good about them people don't respond well to them and that's fine you know it's just they kind of fade away and then maybe a piece of it might show up in another song later or something like that now do some of those songs would they be considered the middle of the b-side of the album as a, what we call a filler song i guess or, or they just don't have enough going for them to keep them around. I, it's more the latter. I, I don't, I don't know that we think of them in terms of, hey, this is a great song for us, you know, or it's just a mediocre. Like we kind of think of them all the same. I think. Now, do you ever, Richie, have the the dilemma of he doesn't like it, you do? No, no I don't think so. Um, not I maybe. Mean, uh, there may have been a song or two that I, I kind of cheered him on. Like, no, don't, don't throw it away yet. It's just, we, we got something going on here, but I can't really pick one out that, that, that happened to, but I, I seem to feel that there was 
probably a song somewhere in there that I thought, oh no, we can, we got something here. So you, it, it, what it sounds like is you're really somewhat on the same wavelength when it comes to music. Yeah. Musically, uh, yes. I mean, the things that, um, like, and you've mentioned before, just uh, my style of guitar is more of a James Taylor thing. Mm -hmm. And Richie's style, while heavily influenced by Jocko, is, is very much like a, a Lee Sklar kind of, and, and, and they did some wonderful things together. Yeah. I think we kind of naturally take that right from the beginning that, you know, that he's he can play in and around the chords because a lot of times I'm playing the bass line too. And for a bass player, it can be very frustrating. Yeah. But for Richie is like, that's freedom because, okay, that's covered. Now let me go play, you know, a harmony to that or something counter to that. So I, I, yeah, I think when we, when we pick a new song or even a cover song, we're, we always kind of gravitate to the, the same place on it. Well, in your live setup, guitar wise, EQ, you don't have a lot of low end, you're very much like James Taylor. Uh, right, right. His guitar, and I guess it's because that's the sound he likes, or maybe whatever sound man he's had for many, many years, that's the, what they've just arrived at, um, is by itself, if it were me playing, I go, ooh, um, I don't have any warmth here. The fellow to my right, Richie, is the warmth. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing, is because um, I... you. We were at Lori Enzo's one time. I went to see you guys. You were out on the patio performing. And you took a break, and you, Rick, said, well, here's the guitar. Play some songs. And it was either I had to tune it to, to, to um, standard tuning or you that was a particular night where you were tuned to standard. And I, I, I hit the first chord. I went, oh, I can't believe this guitar because it's EQ'd so differently than the way I would play. And I had to go, you know, the people sitting in the audience have no clue. It's just a guitar and just play it. Yeah. But the way you do, the sound you get, um, or I guess you look for um, in, uh, Rick, in your guitar complements what, Richie, you do on the bass and vice versa so well, just like mm -hmm. you do when you sing. You're, mm -hmm. The blend of your voices is phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, that's nice for you to say. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's just, uh, in fact, Jeff Fight. I was down in his studio yeah. 10 days ago, mm -hmm. and um, he was playing, Richie, some of your, your new songs that you and Joyce, your wife Joyce yeah. wrote. Uh -huh. And he says, Todd, listen to this. And it, I've forgotten which song it was. And he says, Richie's doing all the harmonies. He said he's a phenomenal harmonizer. Load him up. <laughs> Load him up. And does that help you perform, Rick, knowing you have someone who can harmonize with you very, very well? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I doubt that anyone else has the, the situation that I've enjoyed over all these years as predominantly a, you know, a solo singer-songwriter. I mean, that's my, my roots. And playing with Richie is, there's no labor involved from my, my standpoint at all. He, he picks out really cool harmonies, really cool parts, and he knows them. We, you know, I could introduce a brand new song he's never heard, and by the end of that song, it'll sound pretty much as, as good as it's ever going to sound. He just picks up on everything so quickly. So, um, yeah, it's a great joy. Well, the, the you, musically you fit, but having known you not super well over the years because we don't get to see each other as often as I would like to because I've always enjoyed speaking with you guys and hanging out, is you also seem to be very good friends and really enjoy each other's company outside of performing. Is right. that true? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that Richie never gets on your nerves, Rick? Oh, I can't say that. <laughs> I, I'd have to, to really search for examples of that. Oh. Uh, uh, goodness, we're going to play a song now. We may not do the entire one, but I have a question for you, Rick. Its title is Always Paddle Your Own Canoe. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about that song, if you because it's been a number of years since you wrote it. What what got you to write it, and what's the general theme? Yeah, so I, that one um, started with that concept of 
uh, be in charge of your own direction. You know, figure it out for yourself. Um, and then just toying a- around with ways to say that or, or present that. Uh, I thought, you know, paddle your own canoe was kind of a, an, an easy, nice, hooky way to say something like that. So the song was written around that concept. You want to hear it? Sure. I haven't heard it in five I or do. seven years. So. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Need someone to hold my hand, someone to lead me to the promised land. Though I may go, I may not stay. It's cool that way. From the start, little blonde girl she stole my heart. Hope was romantic, tried and true. She times fall sad. What will I do? Finally, tell me what comes next. It escapes me. What should I expect? A day in the life of. In the life of the wandering man Wandering man It's wrong to pray In me your style Silver suit and a crocodile smile Every way just to wish I might Sing with you One song tonight You never know just what they'll do I'll shake your hand, you raise your face The best of times, really start like this Kindly tell me what comes next It escapes me, what should I expect A day in the life of A day in the life of the one Now, do I hear a melodica in that? This that we were talking about this before we started this cast, and you were saying, "Oh, you guys play the keyboards and stuff." And he's like, "No, I don't. I don't play keyboard." Rick did all that. Really, it sounds like a harmonica type thing. Yeah, he did all that on there. It was like it really lays it down really nice. Oh, really? When and when it because it's it's one of the the major transitions of the song. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like it's it's like. Oh, seg- yeah. segue or whatever you want to call it to bring you into a different feel. Yeah. And uh, I was trying for the life of me. It's not really a harmonica. Let's see. It sounds very much like a melodica. You know, right. that thing where you blow in the right. tube and right. you play it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would have been cooler. No, it sounded <laughs> just, just setting on it. That key- it was that keyboard, too. Well, it's interesting in that I wasn't going to play that entire song. Yeah. 
And it started, and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. And it's interesting watching your faces while you're listening to the songs. And uh, you're, you're much more pensive, Rick. Yeah. Well, that, that's, I was hoping you'd play it because, so the guitar part on there uh, is uh, Tim Pruitt. And uh, Tim plays, he's the guitarist for the new Potato Caboose, who just put out a new album and they're touring around that. And uh, so we had Tim come in and he, he's on a couple of these uh, tracks, but I just, it brought me back to when he was in the studio and he came in and set up and we were in the booth and um, he just played that, those leads over that song, a couple different versions. And that particular one, when he played that, we just all, you know, touchdown, this is yeah. it. Like yeah. we're done. Kick like, booty. Get, we'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, yeah. yeah. And we're hoping to get, Tim involved with our next project as well. Uh, so he's somewhat local. He he is yeah. a, a Maryland guy. Yeah. 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 Now you began recording this CD in Maryland, right? At Omega. Yep. That was yeah. We started there. But you didn't end up there. We you know we we were very uh, intent on getting the best recording that we could get. We weren't as intent on promoting it <laughs> afterwards <laughs> or, or, you know, marketing it. But, yeah. um, yeah, we had kind of convinced ourselves that we needed to, to go to Nashville, uh, for that and, uh, Dark Horse Studios, right? That's Dark Horse. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, that was, that was a big adventure for us in terms of just the quality and the, uh, the way that they do things. It's, uh, it's incredible. Now, how did you choose Dark Horse Studios? There must be hundreds of studios in in Nashville. How did you choose them? Yeah, R Richie had a connection somehow yeah. through a producer. Well, I was I was at the time I was uh, backing up this young lady from the church I went to over in Columbia, Karen England, and uh, another young lady, uh, Kelly Minter. Um, Kelly is now in Nashville and uh, she plays and she also uh, does it. She's written some books on Bible studies and stuff like that. But uh, the common denominator there was Paul. Um, it's his name's on, on the cover. It's been quite a few years, but Paul was a, their producer and um, he had ended up going to, to Nashville and that, that was his kind of home base there at dark horse. So, uh, you know, I talked to him, I said, you know, here's what we got. You know, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the original tracks were all analog. So they ended up, we sent that, those recordings down there, tra they transferred it to, I want to say Radar 24 or some kind of, you know, uh, digital recording and uh, tweaked it around. And then he said, okay, well, come on down. And uh, I think we left on a Friday morning, got down there and, uh, went down to uh to the to the studio and we played into the evening on friday night and on the different songs and then we got back in on he actually put us up for the night we got there on saturday morning recorded all day until we had to leave to catch our flight so it was just like an overnighter to nashville so how much of the omega recording did you literally use and how much new did you have to do down there mm -hmm. to complete it None of the drums were saved. They had them redo all the drums. And, and I only did, like, there was one song I redid bass on. and I th We did a bunch of vocal parts, yeah. and guitar parts. It, I think more what was helpful was the mixing of the song, um, adding a few extra parts, and Paul suggested, you know, a keyboard here, there. So we, he was actually suggesting things to build the song a, a bit better. But then that whole you know, mastering post-production process, um, you know, was very, very helpful. So how, if it was a day and a half or a day, you know, 48 hours mm -hmm. down there, how much time did you spend at Omega <laughs> leading up to that? <laughs> a year? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Off and it was, on. It was quite a bit of time. Was yeah. it? Yeah. Cause it was bit, bits and pieces here and there. Um, you know, with a lot of student education recording sessions, <laughs> you know, um, they, one song that we did on that was mystery to me. 
Yeah, the kids were like, okay, here he goes, Mr. To Me. You know, and it was like, no, no, that's not the name of the song, young boy. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. It was but, good. I mean, it was great because yeah. we were b- still building the songs. Yeah. And we had, you know, some uh, uh, cost breaks there. Right. And it, it was fine. It, 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 but it, we spent a lot of time, but it was, it was fun. And I imagine just the headiness of going to Nashville to, to do some recording, at least for me, that would be, I'd be so nervous I wouldn't be able to stand up straight. What made it nice in a sense, it was down in Franklin, Tennessee. So this is out in horse country. And if you've ever seen this uh, complex, it's, it's a huge cabin. It, it's out in the woods. Um, and there's, you know, a couple of different buildings connected by pathways and stuff. So it wasn't like you were down in Nashville, and that probably cut the ice a little bit. Yeah. The excitement there was we never did see him with John Anderson from Yes. He was recording some music on oh, really? on one of the sections of the studios. We never did see him or anything, but they were telling us that he was there and doing some stuff. Well then the, the studio must have a, a you know Oh it's a good name. Oh yeah. Yeah. Love, love, all your big players have, have recorded there. Really? Yeah. Now the when you record harmonies and Rick, I'm I'm sure you do some harmony work as well, mm-hmm. don't you? Right. Do you do those? Is it all? Is each thing tracked individually, or do you do any of it live? All separate. All yeah. separate. So even if you're both singing back up on a a track, uh, a track, you do it individually, or the both of you are on one mic. Which tra- we'd like to do as much sort of rhythm guitar, bass, to get the feel of the song live. But once that's captured everything else is is separate now do you keep that original or does that there that's just a blueprint so you can work around it mostly i'd say most of the time we keep that yeah yeah not the not the lead vocal that turns out to be the scratch but but yeah the you know the guitar mostly will stay somewhere buried in there somewhere (laughs) (laughs) well the one thing that stands out on this cd for me is and again, this podcast is acoustic radio. Mm-hmm. The in many recordings by acoustic artists, their acoustic guitar is kind of buried so deep, you really have to search it out to find it. Mm-hmm. The one thing on this one is it's it's pretty much front and center on pretty much every every cut, and I, that's one of the things I love about it. Yeah. And whether that was recorded in a Dark Horse or at Omega. Whoever was miking that and EQing that did a fantastic job because in each instance, I think it's perfect for that particular song. Yeah, as it should be. Yep. Yeah, it's nice for you to say. I think that is the intent that um, the chord structure is built in the guitar and some of the chords are sort of inverted and sort of strange sounding. So we keep that. Um, and then it's built around that, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, many of the guitar players out there are going to be curious. Did you use one guitar for all those, or did you use different ones? Uh, different different guitars. Do you remember what you used, which ones? And are they in this room? <laughs> should, I, should I feel the aura of the guitars? The, the one guitar that is on that, that CD um, quite a lot is it's a Taylor guitar, and it was the... Uh, it's the one that I didn't like, the one that I uh, sold. Oh, it was the it was a jewel signature <laughs> oh, model. Oh yes, yeah. And very, very nice sounding recording guitar. Uh, it was perfect. But I could just never get over the fact that it said jewel on the fretboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I finally uh, removed that curse. Um, but it was it was some Taylor guitars uh, of some sort. Because that's all I had at that point. Mm-hmm. And then how many different basses did you use? Sadly enough, I didn't use my bass on that because I was having it redone, the frets redone at the time we did that. So I borrowed a friend's Fender Jazz. And um, I think there was once, when I went to Nashville, I took the fretless. And I can't remember which song it was that I redid. And I used that on that. But I used a, uh, uh, a Fender Jazz that was... Uh, pretty a standard fender jazz it was uh, so that's the only that's my only regrets about it because i know if i would have used my own i probably had a tone a little different than that mm-hmm. 
but it was yeah Fender Jazz. Now Richie, and I'll ask this or, or follow it up with with Rick's response. Is it difficult for you to jump from one bass to the other as far as playing, or is it pretty much instantaneous? Do you have to get used to the ne- the, the new one that you've just picked up? I think y- y- yeah, you get a little feel for it. I think the bigger thing is the tone, getting the tone that you know that. You know, you have this bass since high school. You know what you've got. Uh, it's not a stock bass. It's stock Fender Jazz. It's got, I put uh, the EMG pickups in it. And I know just about where everything needs to be. Mm-hmm. And when I had to use this other one, that's, you know, or anytime you pick up somebody else's, even when I use the Stingray, it's 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 a little different. I got to kind of find that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. And uh and none of them have the sweet spot that the Fender Jazz has. I, mean, <laughs> I, have, I just can, I just like to dial in, you know, the bridge pickup and then bring in a little bit of bass and just bark it. <laughs> now, Rick, d- d- is it difficult for you to jump from um, one of your guitars to the to another? It is now, um, and I think that's over the last five years, maybe. I, I, um, I have a a Keras guitar as made by. Um, bill wise and i had that custom made and it's you know right down to every spec and i had the nut why it's a wider nut and it bothers me now that that that's different than my other guitars um it's the best guitar i own the best sounding guitar but it's 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 difficult for me to switch back and forth to that guitar now doesn't he make a, a shallower fretboard radius as well yeah yeah, it's it's completely different um, in in all good ways, mm-hmm. but it's just different. Um, so, if I take that out to play, I just want to play that. I don't want to play any other guitars. And if I do open tunings, I have to have multiple guitars, so it it doesn't come out as often as it used to. Mm-hmm. So is that so? Which which guitar is do you keep tuned in open C? Uh, I change it around. Oh, you do. But the Keras is really good with that. Yeah. Like it'll take the the low C and and it'll hold it, not be muddy, and and intonates well. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's perfect in all ways except that it doesn't feel good in my hands sometimes. <laughs> well, you know what though the um, because uh, whenever I have a gig coming up the week prior, and I own way too many guitars, I've got three or four that I tend to use as my performance guitars and i will but i'll go through every one in my collection you know multiple times oh which one's which one am i going to take this time this oh i didn't like the sound of that one today you know it usually comes down to partly sound but mostly playability and how comfortable i feel playing it whether the setup is a little better on it or just the feel of the neck does that is that similar when you play bass or is that less of a concern yeah it's the like the 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 jazz has got such a narrow neck and like i say it it's just so easy to play when i play the stingray it's 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 more like a a fender precision it's a little wider a little meat on a little more meat on the neck and stuff um but it it the action's really good it's easy to play in that respect so but it doesn't it doesn't you know i can switch back and forth without any problems so what is the difference in sound between a jazz and a precision? The uh, precision is going to be a little fuller in on the bottom end. The jazz is going to give you a little more bite, um, a little more bright snap, but you don't want to have too much of that. But it just seems to cut through the mids and highs will cut through better mm-hmm. than than your higher strings on like the a precision or uh, a stingray. So the stingray is more equivalent to which of the two? Probably more towards the the, the uh, jazz because it? it's brighter, yeah, brighter. But I'm playing around with flat wound strings now, so I, I'm really tempted to put some flat wounds on the Stingray just to see how it comes around. Mm-hmm. Now, Rick, since I've known you, you play for the most part um, like an auditorium shape or mm-hmm. concert shape or maybe an OM. Did you ever play Dreadnoughts? I did. Um, I'm thinking about going back my. My son just uh, researched and invested in a J45 that I've fallen in complete love with, the way it looks and sounds and everything. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would go back there. Yeah. 
I probably will. Yeah, there's a certain something, and each one, I'm just using Martin and, and Gibson, there's a definite, partly because of the scale length, um, and I think the square shoulder versus the round shoulder or slope shoulder has a lot to do for whatever reason with the, the, what comes out of the ho- sound hole. Um, but there is a definite, especially when you're strumming, there's a definite different musical feel to a dreadnought from an OM or a concert or an auditorium. Um, that being said, I have a Martin DR Centennial, which is a poor man's D28 because it was, uh, doesn't have any bling on it. It doesn't even have gloss finish. It would make a killer bluegrass guitar. It's a cannon. I don't play bluegrass. So to strum it is a little harsh to me. But from a finger style standpoint, it's front and center, man. It is, I don't have to push the gain on a song. I just take out the, the Martin and it works great. But I won't use that live from a strumming standpoint. Although in the studio, it comes across fairly, fairly nicely. So how do you go about, Rick, choosing which guitar you're going to record? Is again, is it the feel of the song or is it more a comfort from a comfort standpoint as a player the, the reality is it's whichever guitar has new strings <laughs> <laughs> got my vote no but i i like a warm although i i do like the crisp sound of an acoustic guitar but i do like it to have some warmth so to me you know how you eq it and everything that you run it through before you record it and and i use you know going direct and mics and all kinds of things i think i could get a sound that i like out of any guitar Mm -hmm. so it's more what have i been playing what i you know maybe what what really what strings are on that guitar and how does it how does it feel you know that day now do you have a particular brand of string you prefer engage i i use extra lights which is why my guitar sounds a little brighter than more the EQ. Um, and I, I kind of play around with the different manufacturers of strings. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have a whole lot of squeak when you play. I do. I just, I guess it's lazy finger. And sometimes you can use that as part of the song, but you, you're a very clean player. Mm. Both of you are. I, the- I, I don't like finger squeak, so I try not, <laughs> I try to avoid it. I find it difficult because you have to pick your finger up. Right. And I'm going up the fretboard quite often, and it's very difficult. Even with a polyweb elixir, mm-hmm. which is a much smoother sounding string, you'll still get a little of that zing. Yeah. Now, there's a string that I can't play. Well, you know, I, I stopped using them when the Phosphor Bronze came out, mm-hmm. uh, the Nano Webs. But on that Martin, I just installed a set of those because it takes away some of the harshness. Not all together. It adds a little bit of a, we were talking about the thump mm-hmm. um, in a stand-up bass earlier. And it does, or thud. Yeah. It gives you, because that's such heavy Gore-Tex on that, that, those strings. But does it, what do you, now, from a bass standpoint, from a guitar standpoint, because of those ridges, you know, and your, however your skin oils are, eventually they, they deaden and have to be changed, mm-hmm. especially if you're playing out and you're perspiring. From a bass standpoint, and I know you said you're, was it flat wounds you're producing now? Yeah, I'm kind of switching over, um, going to the dark side. Um, you know, I, when I got the Stingray, one of the things I noticed, you know, because obviously Ernie Ball Stingrays come with Ernie Ball strings. Yeah. And I really liked the feel. I was like, wow, oh, I like this. And uh, and I start, I actually got sets for the jazz. And I was like, because it is, it it is like they say, they're a little slinkier. And it's still 45, 105, the gauge settings the same. And then, um, I, you know, uh, I like uh, Joe Dart, bass player. He's He plays flat wounds. And he, he plays them on a, a, an Ernie Ball uh, bass guitar. And so I got a set for the for the jazz, and I really like them. And that's there's no noise when you move around yeah. on flat wounds, and uh, and that's why I'm, I'm really I'm seriously thinking about getting a, a couple more sets because I need to replace the ones on the jazz, and in, and putting a set on the uh, the stingray because it'll maybe soften up. Because that's the one thing about the stingray; it's got a little harshness to the brightness in there. I like to think, see if it tames it a little bit. I've I've met two bass players over the years who switched over to those black mm-hmm. strings. I I don't remember what they're made. Are they just coated? Is that what it is? Uh, 
they could be nylon too, but I'm, I don't hold me to that either. I'm not sure, but and, I, I know. Yeah, and both of them said the reason they switched over is they like that stand-up bass mm-hmm. sound, and it yeah. helped give their bass that sound. Yeah, I the, guess. a little bit boomier. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to play a song now, and um, since we're getting close to the end of our hour here, and yeah. I know we're going to chat, we can play either "Traveling Prayer" or "Ordinary Man." Do you either of you have a preference? I would leave that to the gentleman. Tomorrow. I mean, the CD is titled "Ordinary Man." Yes, yeah, play that. Okay, how did you go about choosing that song as the title of the CD? Hmm, I don't recall. <laughs> was it more like, well, we've got X amount of songs, let's pick one. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I'm right on this or not, but just um, we're just ordinary people. It's an ordinary man. I would, I would beg to differ, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, going through life, you know... I think you, sometimes you feel like I'm not, I'm not this or I'm not that, but you're ordinary and there's nothing wrong with that. Well, and as we know, especially in the movie business and in the music business and some others, there are a lot of people who forget that. Yeah. 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 Cause we were definitely uh 40 hour a week guys just having fun on the side. Well, let's <laughs> listen to the 40 hour a week regular guys on the side sing. <laughs> I can't sleep late in the morning My body won't allow me to rest I'm old and getting old So who would have guessed Who would have guessed The invincible feeling When I slip away That the tide might turn And seem somewhat unfair that I'd feel so strange as if I shouldn't stay Look away, please don't stare I know what they say This is just mine, no matter But I'm thinking too much as it is If I could just push a little further I'm sure that's where I could live That's where I could Live to be a rap on men wear my granddaddy's hat Set up strong behind the wheel of my big car Wear an ordinary smile that makes the whole world wander And only dream of how that must feel But the ordinary man reaps just forty souls No peaks and valleys, just a clear road of hope Takes what he needs, pays what he owes, holds strong to his peace of mind. Order never man, order never man now, please. Order never man, order never This place looks familiar It appears to be the last place on earth But it's quite a solemn moment When a man stands to measure his worth So in the midst of confusion Lies his good deeds of the yet to be done And if there's a certain obligation to fulfill that last one Things look different Now it's mid-morning tomorrow And the sunrise with its so aptly named But still it comes without warning As if in some twisted game Careful what you wish for Extra careful how you pray For the answers of tomorrow Are bartered for the struggles of today The ordinary man reaps to what he sows No peaks and valleys, just a clear road of hope 
takes what he needs, pays what he owes, holds strong to his peace of mind. Order never mind. Order never mind, I'll be. Order never to alarm but I could use a helping hand I long to be back where I should be I long to be the ordinary man cause the ordinary man reaps to sporty souls no peaks and valleys just a clear road to hold takes what he needs pays what he owes Hold strong to his peace of mind Order and every mind Order and every mind I'll be Was an order and every such a nice song now rick does it is it difficult for you to hear yourself sing like that um no i guess not i mean are you super critical yeah um yes but <laughs> can't change it it was no, 20, 20 some odd years ago yeah, and i think that's you know that's that's the best performance we could do at that time and yeah i mean yeah they're probably some things I'd change, but, um, I really like that song. Um, that, that song I can remember writing just one evening, the whole thing finished, never changed a word, never changed anything. Wow. Um, so I like that. That's kind of a magical song for me. So when I hear it, I think more about that than the imperfections of, you know, what might be in there. Well, I mean, I'm just a casual listener here, but I don't hear any imperfections. Do you, Rick, Richie? Well, I, I think it makes it more raw, more, I don't know. It's just, sometimes it needs to be that way. I, I, and I don't find anything wrong with it. You know, it, it just, it's a beautiful song. And the vocals come in in and out like nicely. And Well, and the other nice thing, speaking of the bass part is, and again, again, this might have just been you feeling the song, is you're not even in portions of the song or yep. you're so subtle you don't if 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 i i love some bass tracks where i don't actually hear it mm -hmm. but if you take it away it's like oh what's missing no it was it was intentional to have it out yeah in, in, in to 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 redirect the dynamics to the root and then build it to the to the next part and that was the one that i did play fretless on like it started, I was like, oh, this is the one. <laughs> well, you know, I, I only have so many of these little buttons yeah. I can store yeah. songs on yeah. because the, the top three, well, I'll give you an idea of, of what some of them are. <laughs> That's the coffee house one. This is the stadium or the big. And if I, I have a, if I'm interviewing someone who has no originals, because I can't do covers, I don't want to go through the whole licensing thing. Yeah. This is how we start it. It just seems to work, kind of gives a nice mm, yeah. uh, picked up. But the, yeah. uh, you know, the, I was going to play, why don't I just say it? Again, that's a, a bit more of a ballad like this one we just listened to. Um, I just didn't have enough time to play so many. That being said, there are probably many people listening. And this podcast is heard all around the world. Oh, cool. Um, not every week, but occasionally I'll go in because I can look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. And generally, if there are, say, 80 listens in a week or 100 listens in a week, 60% of the U.S. It might be, you know, like we might have 30 in the U.S., 12 from the Philippines, one from Russia, 
one from England, one from France, one from the Dominican Republic. I mean, it's amazing how people find this. But listening to these, and of course, it's one of my favorite CDs of all time. If someone listening to us says, gosh, I would like to have the entire CD, how would they go about doing it? Man, that's a good question. <laughs> we, so we, uh, we've decided very recently, like last week, that we're going to dedicate actual time this winter, starting next week, um, to our next project. And in doing so, also stand up a website and get that CD out on all the, you know, the typical channels as well as our website. So, um, you know, that'll be a Winden and Ricker website or it's Winden and Ricker on Facebook now. Um, but I would say within you know, a couple of weeks, we'll have something stood up there. So how many physical copies of this CD do you have still? Um, including the one that you're carrying around with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I have a, a half of a, a small box with maybe eight or 10 left. We, we did a pretty good job of, of selling them when, you know, at the onset. Yeah. Now, did you start yeah. off with a thousand? Is that what you, you reproduced? Oh, that remember. sounds right. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Cause for a while there, I think you had to do a thousand or yeah. more in order to get the cost affordable. Right. Yeah. Now you can do a 10 or five. They, right. They've, they've become much more competitive in their pricing, but yeah, I think somewhere in the basement of the farm, there's a box with, with about the same, you know, maybe half to three quarters of a box. Um, well, I mean, when you play, um, and maybe you do bring them a few with you and I just don't know that, but I think that you should in the future, when you play live, bring a half dozen with you mm -hmm. and just mention that if anybody wishes to ha take home some of your music, um, we have some with us and, uh, however you want to charge for it. Mark McKay one time was chatting with me and he had had difficulty selling his CDs at gigs and he used to perform fairly regularly at the Frederick coffee company. And uh, we got to chat one day for five minutes and he says, Hey, you know, I discovered something this past Saturday when I played at the Frederick coffee company. I said, what's that? And he says, you know how it's difficult to sell CDs at a gig? And I said, yeah, it's very difficult. He said, so I got my a basket that my wife had and I put a bunch of CDs in it. And he said about three quarters of the way through the second set, he says, you know, he says, I appreciate you all coming out. And he says, I would really love for you to take me home with you. Some of my music he says, I've got a basket of CDs here. He says, I'm just going to pass it around the room. He said, there's no charge if you don't want. He said, but if you wish to, to put some money in as to what you think it might be worth, by all means do so. Um, and I'm going to play my next song. He hands off the basket. And I don't remember how many CDs he had in it. I and mean, it was probably 10, 12, 15, something like that. He said, Todd, it came back empty at the end of the night. And there was more money in there than if I charged $15 a CD. Oh. And he says, so that's the way I'm going to market my CDs in the future. Yeah. Worked really, really well. I tried it and, and the basket came back full. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't blame a guy for trying. No, no, no. A lot of it has to do with the quality of what's on the CD, I'm sure. So you said you're going to start recording over the course of the winter. Do you have some songs already in the can, well, not in the can, but ready to be recorded? Yeah, we have uh, 15. Do you really? And we'll, we'll sort of pair it back from there. Um, and they're, yeah, they're pretty much well-defined, but we'll go through the process, play around, recording rough tracks, take it away, think about ideas, and uh, come to it that way. Now, when you record... I mean, obviously, you've got your, your control pad and the chair and everything like that, but Rick, when you play guitar and record, are you sitting or standing? For guitar, usually uh, sitting. Okay. How about singing? Singing, I usually try to stand. Okay. How about you, Richie? Um, yeah, I can sit there and play the bass, but yeah, standing is the only way to really sing for me. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your goal as far as completing what you're going to record is do, do you have a goal of, you know, we want to have it all done by say the first of March so we can get it mastered and everything and, or not. I think, I think it, we haven't really um, determined that, but I think it'll come in pieces, maybe four or five tunes in a group and we'll get those out there and then we'll work on the next. So, so we're making some progress, you know, as, as we go. So we don't have to wait until 
you know, everything's done. So remind everybody how they can find you currently online. Um, you can find us at Winden and Ricker Facebook. You can message us there. Okay. That's the place. And, and a, maybe a website in the future you, you mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. Very soon. So that's going to be twocoolguys.com, right? <laughs> I think that name's already taken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. I just... Well, we're going to finish the show. We're going to say goodbye to the folks. Um, but we're going to listen because I want to play the last cut on the CD and the boys. And that is, was the title of the, your trio. Is that correct? correct? And it's interesting because when I first had this CD, that's all I saw. Right. I mean, I'm not, I'm slightly colorblind, but obviously this is monochromatic, so I shouldn't have been colorblind. And I said something, I think your wife was sitting off to the side. We might've been at, Lingen or wine cellars or somewhere might have been the coffee company. And I said, I love their CD, the boys. She goes, well, actually the CD is called ordinary man, Todd. And it's, and the boys. No, it's the boys. She goes, she, I, I think I had my, this with me or whatever. And she says, see that thing right there. That's the end. <laughs> oh, I, I never saw that. <laughs> so what's the significant? She told me, but for the benefit of the people listening, what is the significant significance of at and the boys i think the bands we've been in are named after songs so we're in a band sneaky feelings which was a elvis costello song mm-hmm. we like um nrbq mm-hmm. and they have you know their song uh, me and the boys so it's from that song just with less emphasis on the <laughs> yeah. me person yeah. just and the boys we thought that would somehow be a cool thing to do to start that with and well it is a wonderful cd um you guys are wonderful people i've always enjoyed chatting with you i love hanging out with you although we don't get a chance to do it very often and uh i've always enjoyed listening to you while i'm in the audience and you're up on stage or over in the corner wherever we happen to have live music and we're going to finish this off with the last cut on the cds ladies and gentlemen titled and the boys and i do want to thank both rich Rick and Richie for sitting down with me. We've been drinking water and things like that. So it's probably a good time for us to be closing up shop here. (laughs) Yeah. And I might say, Todd, thank you for this and how supportive you've been over the years. It's meant a lot to us. Yeah. It really has. You know, the, if I had my druthers, I would not that I book a lot of places, but I would have you on the weekly rotation. Yeah. Well, I really would because you're, you're one of my favorites. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for listening to the Wispy Mop Music Acoustic Radio Podcast Series. It is produced by me, Todd, middle initial C Walker. Yes, that's right. It's me. And you can find the, the show on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever you look for your podcasts. And again, thanks so much. Here is the, the last song called And the Boys. <laughs> Boys heard the call Struck a mess Something of a mixed idea And they all believed in it all All for one Outside and two They were quick with their questions a Quest for the great and all They were banging on safety in numbers After all, they were far from their homes But after hours Did they speak their minds? Did they search their souls? How did they come to know One thing stands for sure The boys will follow As the naysayers to the ones that will hear And the boys will follow And they will follow Follow that Some of them wrote it down So others might know They were the talk about the town but out of father, father love. 
person to person Lucky one who shook his hand Lesson upon lesson Stronger and kind As they grew to understand But after hours Did they seek their minds Did they search their soul How did they come to know One thing stands for sure The boys will follow Passing their sayers to the ones that will hear And the boys will follow They will follow Follow love Might I call you brother In the end we will need each other And the boys will follow Boys will follow And the 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 boys will follow And they say to the ones that will hear And the boys will follow They will follow Follow love Follow love